Okay, this presentation is going to cover the readings on uh, nuclear proliferation and non-proliferation. Uh, the difference between the two, proliferation deals with the spread of nuclear weapons and non-proliferation deals with the efforts to prevent the spread. And those are two separate uh, separate things. Um, but this is, you know, we, we, we've talked a lot about democratic peace. We've talked a lot about China in the readings and stuff. So even though I have a lot of videos on China this week, we're, we've, you know, we've had that already. We've been there, done that. Uh, I have nuclear uh, proliferation as a topic because it's important uh, and, ob you know, obviously a, a concern, uh, clearly with Iraq and Nor Iran and North Korea. So it's a big issue. Uh, it Obviously, terrorism is another issue. Uh, we have a course in terrorism. We don't have a course in nonproliferation. So I'm trying to hit the nonproliferation harder uh, with the readings here. So let's take a look at what we got. First, we have chapter 23, which is Howlett, 2011. Howlett wrote this. I uh, don't have the, the reference. By now, you should know how to write, write that out. Um, and just kind of, these are slides, copies from slides provided by the textbook. Um, some of the things that the, the chapter talks about it deals with the complex the motivations, the issue of motivations. Why do nations want to acquire nuclear weapons? You know, why wouldn't they develop the capacity if they have it? And why the, why the heck would they give them up, right? And there are a lot of nations that have, in fact, given them up. And so uh, these are interesting questions. Uh, there are empirical problems like technical detection issues and uh, the fact that increasingly the theory is that capabilities doesn't require a test. Um, of course, in theory, it doesn't. Uh, Israel has never had a test. We are, is you know, pretty much open secret. Yeah, Israel's got nukes. Um, never had a test. And so, whereas India, Pakistan, and North Korea have kind of outed themselves by having a test. So, uh, this is the thing of, uh, there's at least one instance where the capability exists without the test. Um, and presumably before people do tests, they've had the things lying around for a while. And then the question of defining compliance versus non-compliance. When are you in compliance with uh, treaties versus, you know, that, that verification thing is important. And uh, the real question, you know, that why are acquiring nukes? Um, my my pr former professor advisor, Bruce Wayne of Mesquita, all hail Bruce, um, he does a lot of work in this area. And his big, especially vis-a-vis -vis Iran, and he argues that one of the key issues is understanding in the Iranian government what people want, what they're after, what their interests are, and how the nuclear program fits. And he says that this is the big thing that the nuclear program is desired by a lot of people as a just that, the nuclear the peaceful nuclear program. There are other groups that desire the weapons capabilities, and they are in conflict, and they are vying for supremacy in the system, but that the peaceful business, you know, largely the business interests in, in uh, Iran, um, and the clerics have a lot of business interests. Keep that in mind, you know, and he, he goes in and looks at who has what and how much power they have in the process, and he says that, you know, the interests of the peaceful guys, they, they are interested in the program, that's why they want it, but they don't want the fallout of no pun intended, of a weapons program. And so the, his analysis is always based on looking at what are the motivations of the different actors and who's ascendant in the, you know, who's in control or no one's in control. It's a, a conflictual policy process, but who's ascendant? Who, who has the preponderance of influence in it that will probably be the one that, that, that reigns? And, uh, Famously, he presented these findings to the White House, uh, and they were, and he said, you know, this is how I go at it, and I try and figure out why they want the program. And one of the high officials said, "Ooh, we never thought about that." And Bruce is famous, you know, likes to say, "Really, that's scary." So there you go. Of course, he doesn't say it that way. That's my interpretation, but he's not too far. Off. Okay.
complex motivations, empirical ambiguities. I don't know how far Howlett gets in it, but these are things that we want to think about. Okay, nuclear control measures all come under the heading of non-proliferation, and they're trying to, you know, they're about trying to uh, uh, prevent the spread or slow down the spread of nuclear weapons technology. And uh, I think, the, you know, it's, it's important that you know these things, right? That you know that the CTBT is a comprehensive test ban treaty uh, and the, uh, you know, know what the missile control regime is. Uh, but it's also important, you know, that's factual information. The key thing is to bring theory always to have ideas along with your facts. Why do you, we think the missile technology control regime might have any effect, right? What, what is it about identifying the technologies that are okay to export and not export that might in some way do anything? I mean, because there's, there's no power, right? There's no material power involved here, uh, you know, in, in doing this. Uh, it's just, hey, this is an agreement we, that people have, have gone, you know, the major exporters have said this is what is okay to export and what isn't okay to export. How does that work? And, you know, that's the kind of thing you got to be thinking. And, of course, it works in kind of that liberal institutionalist idea that, hey, reducing uncertainty, making, okay, this is okay and this isn't, having identified that, that allows you to talk about whether people are complying or not complying. You can look at what other people are doing uh, and uh, track, you know, you can better identify who is playing nice and who isn't. And this improves cooperation because it makes it easier to see if someone's, you know, we all have this agreement that we're going to try to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons because this is good. This is good for all of us, right? If we, we don't let these things spread. Um, however, we do know that everyone wants to sell stuff to people that people might, there might be a chance to defect from an agreement. It's a prisoner's dilemma, right? You know, that, that if, if, if you can defect from it and sell the technology, then there's this gain to be had from it. Uh, and so it's all a question of, can we manage this system, identify the cheaters, and have some confidence that other people aren't doing this. Because my not selling technology is only valuable if if everyone else isn't and the world is not proliferating. If the world prol prol proliferates and I just missed out on selling my technology, I'm really screwed. I'm, well, fairly screwed. See, I've been sucker punched. And so the question is, how do we make people feel comfortable they're not being sucker punched so that they go along with the agreement. And this is how it works. And do you see how bringing in the concept of prisoner's dilemmas and how cooperation works and how reciprocity works and how it's important to be able to identify the cheaters versus the, the compliers or the defectors versus the cooperators in the terms of prisoner's dilemma. And, you know, that's how it fits. So you have to have the ideas to couch the facts in and to interpret the facts. That's what I want to bring up. Non-proliferation treaty, obviously that's the big one. You should know a little about that. 189 parties have signed it. Uh, every five years they talk about it. Uh, has it gone on? One of the big problems they have with the non-proliferation treaty was originally the idea was that the nuclear nations were going to cut back and get rid of, and, and, and they never did. They've never bought into what's, we're going to do away with these nuclear weapons. Um, and that, some people argue, has been one of the big problems with it is that you know, you can't say it hasn't worked because, uh, well, you can, but you can't say it hasn't worked on the rogue nations and that these things never work because, well, you haven't tried it. You haven't gone ahead and done, the nuclear powers haven't done what they needed to do. And you can always take the real, uh, another point of view. That that's what, you know, who's going to give away, do away with the nukes? You can't do away with them. Uh, if we do away with them, someone will, that would only increase the incentive for somebody to develop their own. Right, or to you know suddenly, oh hey, you guys got rid of nukes, great, I got them. Um, of course, there is always that. Obviously, that's part of the problem. But key thing I want you to take away: do you know know this chapter? I mean, you know this section of the chapter. Understand what these things are. These are examples of of neoliberal institutionalism. 
just make sure you connect the dots, that you interpret them, that you see them through the lens of neoliberal institutionalism and perhaps criticize them through the lens of realism. Associate the theories with these things uh, and th that information will be useful in answering essay questions and that sort of thing in the future. Just citing these things, just citing facts without the ideas that interpret them, the theories that explain how they rela relate, right? Because theories explain how phenomena relate to other phenomena. And so when you cite a fact, if you want to draw a conclusion from citing that fact, you are going to be talking about how this fact affects some other thing. Well, you got to have a theory, right? It, if you don't cite it and you don't say it, you're leaving it implicit, in which case we have no idea. You know, you're making this stuff up, or you know, how am I supposed to know what you, what, what the can, how, what the logic is that's driving your inference from fact to conclusion? That's why theory is so important. However, you do need to know these uh, the facts are important too, right? And so you want to understand how all these things work and and relate them to theories, especially like I say, neoliberal institutionalism. Okay, enough of that. The other thing that comes out that is interesting, this is a very important, uh, con this is one of the more clear-cut theoretical issues. Uh, when, when people get questions about nuclear nonproliferation or proliferation, say, on the comprehensive exam, one of their big problems is not having the theory, right? And in uh, this one reason I was harping so much on the last slide about needing to have the theory in there. Um, but the one thing that really is out there that, that is kind of a go-to is this Walt Sagan debate, right? And uh, Walt gets more, it's often just Walt's. It's not, Sagan's not necessarily automatically brought up, although it is good if someone brings up Walt's to say, oh, there's the Walt Sagan debate because Sagan is a counterpoint. And Walt's and Sagan published a book together making the argument. So, you know, Walt has identified him as the other the counterpoint. The Waltz thesis, and Waltz was obviously a realist, um, but Waltz, you know, explicitly says these things. He says, look, slow spread of nuclear weapons is better than rapid spread or no spread. If there's a rapid spread, then uh, it unst it's uncertainty and, you know, cha rapid change, bad, because it would mean that there was a rapid change in the distribution of capabilities in the system. That's almost the definition of instability. It would create, you know, uncertainty and, and distrust. And so that would be not so good. However, no spread is not good because states have needs that have to be met. And so this kind of status quo uh, would mean that there would be a disconnect out there. So a slow spread is probably okay. Uh, he argues it's best. He also argues that, look, new nuclear states are going to ultimately be constrained by the responsibility associated with nukes, that they are going to, you know, suddenly they got these things, uh, they have to worry about protecting them, they got to worry about whether they use them, suddenly their decisions are very important, right? They are now in the big boy club. And so he argues that this develops a sense of responsibility on the nation's part, uh, and encourages them to use greater caution. And so he says, look, there is a change in how these guys act because, now, and again, we're kind of, he's now talking about, you know, we usually talk about realism as viewing the world as being billiard, a billiard table where the balls bang against each other. And the thing about a billiard ball is it's solid all the way through. There's nothing inside the billiard ball, right? To a certain extent, Walt, is Waltz is going back on that by suggesting that, oh no, there is actually something going on. Some billiard balls are more cautious than others. I don't know how that translates into a game of pool, but you, I hope you, you follow me here as he's, he's starting to go into internal characteristics. Um, now you, you could argue that, well, that's simply because the capability is so, you know, is so qualitatively different, right? Nukes are, are, are a big deal. Um, but, you know, like I say, we're, we're edging up on things, and he frequently isn't, you know, pushing the limits of the, the his very clear, very 
parsimonious and precise theoretical model he laid out. He goes on to argue, though, that the likelihood of war is going to decrease as the current deterrent capabilities increase. So responsibly use nukes, which would presumably be nukes that aren't used, uh, make wars harder to start. Right? You know, kind of paraphrasing the the, the box in the uh, in your textbook that talks about this here. Um, and the idea, though, is that, and this is this thing: is hey, when when you have the spread of this deterrent power, it makes people more secure. Notice the realists have a real easy time. They're not worried about motivations because they have already assumed the motivation. There is one motivation, it's greater security, right? Period, full stop. And have, you know, so there's no question there about that. Um, and the art, and he's, there is, you know, inside the billiard ball that, you know, he's arguing that, hey, to the extent that we look at that within the billiard ball, it does encourage them to be more cautious and develop this capability, uh, develop the sense of responsibility and, and uh, a, take a more cautious approach. So this is Waltz's thesis that don't worry, be happy. You know, how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb, which of course, Dr. Strange loved subtitle. Now Sagan, not Carl Sagan, Scott Sagan, uh, makes this counter argument. Now Sagan is a guy who is big into institutional theory and studying organizations. And he has looked and, and studied the, uh, a, a lot of his research has been into the systems established for protecting or for controlling nuclear weapons and the failures that occur in these systems. And he's always been the guy to talk about the, you know, the nagging, the, you know, the oopses, right? The, the unintentional, the accidental, right? And that, yeah, sure, maybe no one is going to conscientious, you know, consciously, deliberately get into a nuclear free-for-all with another nuclear power. However, comma, uh, the possibility of error is always there. And... The problem with nukes is, uh, you know, one error could be a, a really a noticeable event in world history, right? You know, even if it's one-sided, even. Uh, it, it, we've had no uses of nukes since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we could have one, right, if someone messes up. The argument that it is developed more in the book, so, you know, that tends to be where he's coming from, um, is... He goes further, and one of his conclusions from studying how organizations work is that professional militaries, they tend to have parochial interests. They tend to be worried about their, uh, their budgets, their status, their prerogatives, you know, uh, in, in, when we talk about not just the U.S. military, other militaries that traditionally the prerogatives of the military within society, you know, who do they take orders from, who, what, what, uh, you know, where do they fit in the budget process? Uh, how are they viewed? Uh, are important. And, you know, you, I mean, France, the Picard affair in France uh, was a, uh, a, a huge, a huge one. And, um, oh, excuse me, not the Picard affair. Picard was the investigator. The Dreyfus affair. Uh, the Dreyfus affair was a huge one where, the, the issue was very much the prerogatives of the military. Could the military be criticized even in the society? And I mean, they, they went, they were serious. This was a huge thing of a democratic society, albeit in the early 20th century. So there are parochial interests and in, and some of them go beyond just budget maximization, right? Especially when you imagine other societies. Also, the concept of routine, you know, that they get this, this is our standard operating procedure, this is what we do, uh, you know, leads to people to act more mechanically, uh, not perhaps cognizant of the situation in the way the deterrence models expect them to be. There's maybe not that flexibility uh, in that uh, process. So um, he argues that because of this, professional militaries are going to behave in ways that are going to lead to deterrence failure or possibly deliberate or accidental war. 
right? That that these, uh, you know, they're not going to act in the way that our models of deterrence tell us they should act, right? And that they're going to be the the uh, they're going to be doing things that uh, uh, are not optimal and not the way that people like Waltz see them doing them. He also argues that future nuclear states, and he look you know looking at it, the states that we're talking about, your Korea and your uh, Iran's, and you know the the states that that are going to uh, in Pakistan at the time, you know, uh, we, we, you know, he says, look, these are frequently they're run by the military, or have weak civilian control, and you know, uh, that the military has. Again, we go back into that, you know, they have a lot more influence over things than in your uh, more developed countries. And uh, therefore, we should be worried about whether they're going to have the constraining mechanisms that other states have had. And if they lack them, uh, you know, that's a, they're, they're going to have a big problem because at, at the same time, the military biases are largely going are likely to be greater in these countries, right? And therefore, uh, they might actually want to use these things and show their capability. And um, and so he kind of argues that look, you know, this is kind of a worst case. We have lack of control, uh, and these organizations are more biased, they have more of these bad organizational characteristics that, that I've seen. And so this is his argument that, that we should be very much afraid of, the, uh, of these things, uh, that while it's possible that the deterrence thing is working for future states, maybe not so much. And we should be really worried about the organization, uh, organizational aspects, the questions of how these things are controlled are, are really important, according to Sagan. So there you go. That's an interesting argument, counter argument. Now, moving on from the chapter in the textbook to the JSTOR readings, I have two here. The first one is Sing and Way, 2004. And they have a real nice uh, look at nuclear proliferation. And here, what they're interested in is uh, the question of proliferation. When when does it occur, right? What are the factors that encourage, that create a proliferation event with a state developing nuclear weapons? So the dependent variables, nuclear proliferation. Um, the interesting thing here, this is an empirical work. It's one of those ones I maybe hate, but um, the key thing though is, or, or an interesting part of it is that they have a really nice summary of the theoretical approaches. And so I really like this for students in that, you know, you read the first part and, and they really do cover the, the, the literature and, and, and not just cover it, they kind of say, look, there's three approaches, the, you know, they, they aggregate into or categorize into three things. There's, there's people who focus on technological determinants of whether uh, states achieve nuclear, uh, you know, uh, create nuclear weapons. Uh, there's external determinants in terms of the international system, and then there's internal ones, right? And Sagan is one of these guys, you know, what goes on within the state. And so they bring that together. So I think that's very useful. But then they also test it, right? And that's the key thing is they, they go the extra mile. They provide us the empirical testing, which I'm, I'm trying to push as you to see is the closing of the loop. Not all loops are closed in international relations. And the loops feed back on themselves too, right? So once you, the loop is closed, it's not, you know, the loop, it might be closed, it's not finished, right? I wanted to say it's closed, but not closed for business, something like that. Um, and we can go back and question things and all, but really until you've gone through the empirical thing, you, you, you know there's something that you haven't even looked at, given a first look at. So I like to have that here as well. Um, Looking at, they have this nice table that, that tells you, okay, here are the theoretical explanations 
right? And they say, you know, on, on the left side, we have all the explanatory variables, right? And so grouped together in terms of, you know, the technological approach, right? Which sees that technology is deterministic of whether or not the state gets nukes. And so level of development and industrial capacity are the two things that are identified as being associated with the likelihood. And, and then we have the middle column tells us, okay, what what's the association? It's positive. So higher level of development means it's more likely for proliferation to occur, for them to acquire nuclear weapons. Um, and then we have the operationalizations, right, in the right-hand column showing how are we going to measure level of development? Well, we're going to say it's gross domestic product per capita and energy consumption per capita. So we have two indicators to give us an idea of the level of development of a, a country. And for industrial capacity, again, higher industrial capacity, more likely they're going to be able to make a new. All right. Uh, and then how do we measure that? Well, an index based on steel production, electricity, aggregate per capita electricity and steel production, right? And there's that electric, electricity and capacity and steel production along, along with uh, a measure of per capita, right? You know, to, to, to divide it by the number of people in the society gives us a sense of how, how their industrial capacity is. Again, we're showing how we operationalize things, right? We go from the concept to an indicator we can measure. Uh, and so this kind of this this table is very lays out all these ideas of what you know on the on the left side here's the idea of what we think is explaining right what if, if we're interested in whether or not a state acquires nuclear weapons here are all the things that we think are related to that right and again theories relate one idea to a phenomena to another an independent variable to a dependent variable and here we have all these different ones right so we had technological determinism, then we have external determinants, security threat. Does this, you know, brilliant, right? Why does a state want nukes? Because they're freaking threatened, right? And so, why, you know, why do they need nukes? Why, what, so security threat is positively associated with uh, uh, getting nukes. Um, a security guarantee, on the other hand, is negatively associated. Right? And so, you know, why doesn't Japan, I mean, Japan, are they threatened? Mm, yeah. Certainly, I mean, it, it's clearly, if the Japanese want nukes, they'll make nukes. Right? They can do it. If, if, they, if they can't do it, no one can do it. But are they threatened? Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but they have a security guarantee. Right? Freaking United States will just show up and handle it. So uh, they are technically under our nuclear umbrella. Right? So, whoa, why would we need that? Um, and, of course, we have the operationalizations. Right? So... Finally, internal determinants, right? We have democracy, democratization, global democracy, exposure to global economy, economic liberalization, dissatisfaction, symbolic motivations. You might say, hey, where's Sagan in all this? Well, remember, Sagan is arguing about what happens, the impact of proliferation, not whether proliferation will occur or not. So that part of Sagan we were talking about before uh, doesn't apply here because remember Waltz and Sagan are talking about the, you know should we worry about proliferation or not this is talking about whether proliferation will occur or not different subject by the way Rosh House the guy we're going to study look at next is, deals with that Sagan Waltz issue so here we have all these theoretical explanations I really like this table so you know that's one reason that you had to read this article Now their results here they uh, uh, they do they do a lot of voodoo they, they do the hazard rate models which are uh, not quite regression right they're more sophisticated and they're the, like I say the kind of thing that insurance companies use to figure out who's more likely to have a car accident or something like that or die you know actuarial tables and that kind of thing up uh, they don't get you don't get the the nice pretty I mean, you might not consider them pretty you don't get the more standard ols uh regression results with the coefficients and the asterisks and all 
you do sort of, but uh, one of the things with a hazard rate model is it allows you to well, actually talk about percentage changes. And so one good thing these guys did is table two, I believe, when they have their table two, they're, they're giving you the standard re reporting of results. They go on to do the, the math and to translate those results into actually what are the substantive, what's the percentage change in the baseline hazard rate of a nation acquiring a nuclear weapon. And they lay it out here. And for each variable, they say, okay, what goes up, what goes down, right? And so negative means it's less likely to occur. And oh, by the way, their dependent variable, they have explore and acquire. They break down the dependent variable into that question of, are, is a nation exploring, uh, trying to get nuclear weapons, you know, starting to do the research versus does it actually acquire, right? So they had the dependent variable measured by two in two ways. One, is a nation exploring it? And two, more concretely, did it actually frickin' acquire this stuff? Great power alliances, negatively associated, right? Participation in an ongoing military rivalry, right? That's the threat. Whoa, that's a big one. Uh, industrial capacity, yeah, right? Being able to produce a nuke increases the chances that you explore doing it or and greatly increases the chances that you f actually frickin' do it. Um, so I'll let you, you know, I'll let you look at all these things. Interestingly, however, at the bottom, increase in democracy, uh, oh my, <laughs> you actually are more likely to get nukes. So there you go. You need to spend more time looking at that and reading it, but this is, uh, I think, the interesting thing, right, that they, uh, you know, that they have, and, and we're happy that they have it, right, that we see this. Um, but the point is they, they find a lot of support for a lot of ideas in there, although maybe not so much democracy. Their conclusion is that the theories do pretty well at identifying significant independent variables. Um, they note that threat and economic development, right, the capacity, are the two biggest factors, right? And they argue this supports realism, right? That it's about capabilities, right? So if, are you threatened? Then you get nukes. Of course, your ability to make nukes affects, you know, your you know, of what you do, right? You you have to have the capability to do it. Um, and that's a material question, right? And all that is in the realm of realism, right? Because they're all about capabilities. Right? They, however, they, you know, one of their conclusions, I thought a very interesting comment they made is, well, you know, if, if threat is such a big thing, whether if a nation feels threatened, that's when they go for developing nukes. And you know, they say, well, then you really have to question the wisdom of threatening states, right, with all sorts of bad consequences if they develop nukes because you're, you know, you're increasing the threat, right? So you're actually increasing what's motivating them rather than addressing their security concerns and saying, hey, look, you know, this is what we'll, we'll, we'll what are you worried about? You know, let's see if we can't chill you out and then you don't need these nukes. Um, and that I thought was an interesting uh, way. And I think what you want to do is, you know, it's always interesting to look at how authors take an empirical finding and leverage it into a conclusion about the world and, or an implication for the world. And so that's something I think you might want to note there in their conclusion, how they do that. Finally, there's Rosh House. And I've just got like one, I've got two slides for this guy. Um, and definitely looking at what he calls the nuclear peace hypothesis, uh, and he's you know really going to the more to the Waltz uh, argument, the Waltz thesis here, uh, and this is a very classic way of of approaching. You know, this is a very much the positivist approach to things. Is we've got the theory, we're going to develop hypotheses and test them, and and we have four hypotheses that. In his theoretical section, he talks about okay, why do the why are these the hypotheses? These are the predictions of the theories. Remember, that's the point about theory; they can make predictions. And so, hypothesis one: the probability of a major war between two states will decrease if both states possess nuclear weapons. Right? Um, 
that's obviously right. Uh, one of them, and he talks about that. He also has these other ones, uh, hypothesis two, probability of crisis initiation and limited use. So, so you have war on the one hand, then we have hypothesis one deals with major war. Hypothesis two, the probability of crisis initiation and limited uses of force between two states will increase when both states possess nuclear weapons. It's the idea that, well, they're worried about each other because they have nukes. And they're also not that worried about a major war erupting, so more limited ones are more likely to occur. Right? So you want to go through and, and read those, how he derives all of these hypotheses. Uh, but what's important is he tests them. And the first two hypotheses are confirmed, you know, just cut to the chase with these in italics, uh, based on the analysis. Uh, of 611,000 dyads. <laughs> you gotta got love those dyads. Uh, he, uh, we see the first two hypotheses are confirmed. When, uh, when two states, and he talks about symmetry versus asymmetry, when a symmetric dyad, right, where they both have nukes, right, the actual probability that two nuclear you know, uh, such a dyad, a symmetric one, will go to war as opposed to other dyads. No, they're less likely to go to war. However, they are more likely to get into some kind of crisis, right? Some kind of limited use of force. Okay. The other hypotheses, though, about basically asymmetric dyads. What happens when one state has nukes and the other doesn't, right? And the first one is the probability of major war between two states will decrease or remain constant if one state possesses nuclear weapons. Right? So if one state gets nukes, it should either decrease it or shouldn't change it, right? is the thing. What they find is it's not significant, but the, uh, the, it, that's not the case. We don't see either it staying the same or decreasing. We actually see it slightly increasing, although it's not significant. So we don't see this. There's no nuclear peace effect in an vis-a-vis uh, -vis war with an asymmetric dyad. Hypothesis four, the probability of lower level conflicts will decrease or remain the same if one state possesses nuclear weapons. In fact, that's not confirmed. Not only is that not confirmed, the opposite occurs, right? When one state has nuclear weapons and the other doesn't, we have an, we have an asymmetric dyad they're more likely to get into lower levels of conflict, right? So, hmm, this is what he calls the stability-instability paradox. Kind of nice, kind of interesting, right? And uh, so, the, you know, take that and think about that. Uh, one last thing I do want to point out. Uh, in doing the, in doing the, the research and applying this and testing these uh, hypotheses, it is interesting to note, and I've got a reproduced figure one here from Rosh House, uh, how he operationalizes conflicts. And he has this little, I don't know that this picture does much for us, but uh, the idea of having four different measures of conflict. We have MIDs, which are militarized interstate disputes. Those are things that are identified in the Correlates of War project as a, uh, they're, they're, it, it, it basically the researchers have said there was a dispute between the states that got militarized, right? That means that threats of force were used and the, you know, the researchers of, for correlates of war had to, uh, I believe it's correlates of war. Uh, I, that's the data set they're using. Uh, there are a couple of them, but the idea of a mid, right? That's a thing. And it's been identified by other researchers, and they have criteria by which they, you know, identify this thing. The key thing is that actual violence doesn't need to occur. It's a dispute that it was in some way militarized. Then we go to force, which is they actually used force, right? Uh, they had some level of force being used. Then we get to fatalities. Hey, how many people were, were killed in these things, right? We have uh, events where fatalities occurred, and then we get war as again identified in the data set as a major war with a thousand battle deaths. I believe that's the, the way. I want to draw your attention to that as you read uh, 
that that's what's going on all right and i might have missed specified something here and kind of quickly going through it but uh, like fatalities um but as you read through you see hey here are four different ways of measuring the same thing this concept of conflict and so we he's kind of again when i talked about problematizing ideas uh i don't know if you problematized conflict as much as he unpacked it and by having four different measures four different indicators uh, saying that there are higher levels of conflict. We can have a, a dispute, we can have a use of force, we can have you know, a certain number of fatalities going on, or you know, we can have people actually dying, uh, and then we can have war, right? where it's just on. And um, these are uh, four different ways of measuring. I thought it was worth you know, noticing. Certainly, hopefully you're getting, if, if, not, if nothing else, hopefully the term operationalization which usually is not included in your spell checker, um, is getting a little bit more common to you. Okay, so there, there we have overall, we have the chapter on nonproliferation. We had two, uh, two different research papers, two different empirical papers that covered the theories. And so, you, you know, I think this gives you a pretty good idea. And, and hopefully what you go in, you can see we have a mix of ideas and I, I don't even want to say facts but you know we have results where the ideas have been tested and hopefully this kind of gives you a deeper knowledge and, and again I'm trying to give that idea of this is where we want to go and this is how we want to think and you know how we want to talk about knowing stuff about the world we're still not sure we got a lot of questions that are unanswered but we've gone a little deeper and we have reasons to think we know what we know and reasons to or we also think we know what our limitations are and that's kind of what we try to do